Morning, everyone. Morning, church. I'm glad to be. I'm glad to be. I'm honestly glad to be here. I had hoped and waited for a chance to visit you guys, but the Lord has provided an opportunity, and I'm glad to be here. And I really say, the Lord is good to you all. The Lord is good to you all. What a beautiful place. What a beautiful place. God is good. Amen. I have not come to preach. I've not come to preach, neither have I come to teach. The guys at the rehab will bear testimony to me. I always tell them, Devon is a, the best teacher that we, we teach. I, look, I, I tell them about the Doug Batchelor and all good teachers. And I talk, no, because you're local and you know, I say, if you want a clarity on the subject, Devon teaches. And he goes very in-depth in his teaching. And because I'm dealing mainly with non-Adventists, it's difficult to go deep into spiritual prophecy until you first do the st study on spiritual prophecy. And so you've you got to tiptoe around the subjects until you get to spiritual prophecy. Then you can explain what is spiritual prophecy, how it works, how it edifies the church. That's the that is what spirit of prophecy is there for, to edify the church of God, that the church of God may grow together. And uh, if you don't believe in the spirit of prophecy, you're simply just not a seven-day Adventist, because we believe in the spirit of prophecy, and it is a biblical doctrine. It is a biblical doctrine. It's not something that we as a church has conjured up to make our, to cement our beliefs or to concrete our beliefs. No, it is a biblical teachings, teaching that the spirit of prophecy is amongst, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 8, I think it's verse 16, it says, the spirit of prophecy is amongst the disciples of Jesus. So if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must believe in the spirit of prophecy. But that's just basically what I, the problem, the challenges that I face in presenting certain subjects. The state of the dead, we've done the state of the dead. Then the guys that come, they, they're not, they don't know what they've done for the first time. And so they're hearing things that are new and they, they're trying to understand it and wrap their minds around it. Thank God for the books that we have that the guys are reading. And I tell you what, these guys are lapping up the books. They're lapping up spirit of prophecy, spirit of prophecy. I think Robert is only about not yet a month. And I don't know how many books he's read already. I think there's about two, or he's on to the third one. But he's, he's, you know, he's reading the book, spirit of prophecy. It helps explain the subjects. But as far as me teaching you all, yeah, I don't think I can teach you all anything more than what you'll learn here. Yeah. What you'll learn here yeah, is very in-depth, and you won't just hear this at any other church. So I've not come to teach, neither have I come to preach. So what have I come to do? Come to encourage you all. To, in what you're doing, I've come to encourage you all and to tell you all that, listen, don't give up. Don't give up. I was reading this text in the Bible and I'm saying to myself, there were two ways in which it should go. I could have preached on it or I could encourage you all on it. And I've come to just encourage you all on the word of God and tell you all to continue in what you're doing. Continue. Turn with me in the Bible, please, to the book of Luke chapter 9. The guys who heard me preach last week at Greenwood Park are thinking, oh, there we go, Luke chapter 9 again. <laughs> trust me, trust me, it's not. And if you're tired of listening to Devonay, just understand, 
Catholics, Anglicans, a lot of churches have to deal with the same preacher every week. And he doesn't, he just uses one book and he goes through it all the time. So you all won't die, don't trust me, you all won't die. You all are blessed, amen. Luke chapter 9. Are we there? Luke chapter 9. That's the other thing is that uh, when dealing with the guys there back at home, we got to first teach them the books of the Bible, where they are. And so it's very elementary stuff, you know, very elementary stuff first. It's not what you all used to, yeah, you'll have a slide and everything and you'll have all this modern equipment. We don't have that there, but the Lord is there with us too, amen. Luke chapter 9. And verses 51, we're just going to focus on this one verse, Luke 9, verse 51. It says here, yeah, now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, as we open your word, Lord, I don't know. I don't know anything, Father. I don't know anything. I'm trusting you to explain this verse. I'm trusting your Holy Spirit to give me words, to put text into my mind, everything that comes, may it come from you. May the words that we speak, may the, 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 the text that we read, may they be edifying, edifying to the church here. I pray, Father, please lead out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As the camera set for here, so I can't move this side or that side. <laughs> Little but okay. It limits me. It limits me. And uh, yeah, so we'll try to, I'll try not to forget that uh, we're in front of a camera. I'm going to be on TV, babes. <laughs> <laughs> Now the time had come to pass. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be to be received up. You know, Jesus often used that term. He says, For the time is at hand, or my time has not yet come. He often used these words to describe Jesus' life was very ordered. He didn't come down with the master plan from heaven. No. It would have given him an unfair advantage. So day by day, as he spent time with his father, his father revealed the plan for him. And daily he had to submit to his father's leading. Yes, he knew his out his ultimate goal. He understood his ultimate goal. Jesus did not come here knowing. When he was a child, he did not come here knowing he was the son of God. But as he sat in the, at his father's feet through his mother's teachings, he became to understand who he was and the plan was revealed to him daily as he walked with his father. Yes, there were things that he knew as he matured. And when Jesus became the Messiah, things changed a bit. Things changed a bit. He began to know and he began to remember who he was before he came to this earth. John 17 makes it very clear when he tells, when he prays to God, his father, and he says, Lord, the glory that I had before, he understood who he was before. But nothing was taken for granted that Jesus knew. But he began to know. And as he became the Messiah in, 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 from uh, AD 27, he became the Messiah. And he became also the Son of God. He always referred to himself as the son of man never does he just refer to himself in public to the son of god but he knew he was the son of god he very often told people that he was the son of god 
The Bible says here, now when the came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, Jesus was homesick. Jesus was homesick. He longed for his father's presence. He not, 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 not the adoration and the praise and the glory. No, he just longed for home. How many of you all came out here, yeah, started out, Sister Malisha, came and people got homesick. They went back home. And they called Durban home. The same with us. We had a lot of people. But people got homesick. And they went back home. And it's understandable. We had a girl there that came to the rehab over there. And we... we to myself, how could she have made that decision? She came and she came from sleeping on the steps in the flats in, in, in Wentworth. She came, she was sleeping on the steps. Her daughter and her boyfriend slept in the house. She slept outside on the steps. And I said to her one day, I said, on a Sunday afternoon, I said, don't you just wish to just relax? You don't have to do anything. Just relax inside home and have a, a, a drink or whatever it is. You know, a couple of, I wasn't talking about, <laughs> not talking about the drink, drink. I'm talking about tea or coffee or juice or whatever it is that you fancy. Don't you just wish to be inside, indoors? When it's cold, you just want to be indoors, but you got the steps. And you can't go and sit there during the day because people use the steps. Don't you just wish to be belong to a home? And she shook her head and she said yes. And, and what we offered her, we offered her was a bed to sleep in. Food was there. Everything, Bible studies was there. Everything, uh, well, maybe it wasn't her home, her house, but it was in a home. And she had a bed to sleep on. And she had food to eat. And she had everything you know, well, not everything, but things to make her comfortable. It was 10 times or 100 times better than where she was. And she still went the steps. She still went back to the steps. Mm. Yeah. She left us and she went back to the steps. Mm. Why? You ask yourself, why? Why would she do that there? That was home. Her daughter was there. It was home. And we, we, we can't understand how, what would make a person do such a stupid thing. But that was home. Home is where the heart is. And Jesus' home was up in heaven while he was the son of man he understood his role as the son of man he knew more than the son of man he was the son of god and he says father i wish that they might know the glory that i had before jesus was homesick the Bible says here, yeah, when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly, I think we need to go and look up that word steadfastly. Jesus was determined. He was bent to go to Jerusalem. You know what was waiting him, awaiting him at Jerusalem? The picture we saw today. The crucifixion. That was what was awaiting him. He steadfastly went to Jerusalem. He knew what was go he was going into. But he went because it was time for him to go home. And Jerusalem lay in his part between him and home. And if he was committed, he was committed to Calvary. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verses 8, it says, yet he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. 
It's, you know, when I, when I read that day and I was contemplating it and I thought to myself, wonder of wonders. Be astonished, O oh heaven, that Jesus Christ knew what was he was getting himself into, yet he committed himself to the cross. I don't understand it because human, you, you know, they say the first law of, of, of human, uh, you, self, self-preservation. Self-preservation is the first law of humanity. We preserve ourselves at any cost. We, 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 we might give ourselves a bit here and there. We might, do you know, we, we hear because of self-preservation. Because we want to get to heaven. We, we, we're not here because we want to go to the cross. No. We yeah because of self-preservation. We want to. We want ourselves saved, and so we get to the cross. And there, there's not another person that ever lived on the earth that was selfless like Jesus. There's not another person. I don't care whether you say Paul or whoever it was. There was not another person who was selfless as Jesus Christ. You see, we all do it for a reward. We all do it for a reward. Jesus Christ came to this earth with no guarantees that he's going to make it. Then it was just a facade. If there was a guarantee that he was going to make it, everything was just a facade. Every temptation was just a facade. But there was no guarantees that he was going to make it. And therefore the devil had full authority and full power to attack him because there was an opportunity that he just might sin. And so Jesus Christ committed himself to the cross in spite of the fact that he might not return to his father. When he got up from the grave, there was no guarantee that he had made it. He told Mary, what did he say to Mary? He says, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Spirit of prophecy says, between his meeting and the disciples, he went up to the father and he presented himself and his sacrifice was accepted. The plan of salvation had been secured. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price. He paid the price, the judgment, justice required from the broken law of God. And only one person could give it was the lawgiver himself. It's either the law gets done away with or the lawgiver gets done away with. And Jesus, God the Father says, rather the lawgiver gets done away with than the law itself. And some people have the nerve to tell you today that the law is done away with the laws. No, Jesus, the Father himself. Listen. God himself suffered with Jesus Christ on the cross for the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It wasn't Jesus alone. They know the father was with him. Which father enjoys watching their child suffer? He was with his son and and, and every time they whooped him and I can imagine the father just turned his back. He couldn't bear it. Jesus himself said, Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you turned your back on me? The father could not stand to see what they were doing to his son. Not because he'd done anything. Because they who were crucifying him had done something. And knowing, if I knew, if you knew, if you knew what you were going to, man, common sense would tell you, go the opposite direction. Leave Jerusalem, go the other side. You know what they're going to do. Get out of Jerusalem. Flee from Jerusalem. But the Bible says he steadfastly. We get a little glimpse of it. We get a little glimpse of it of of Paul. Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 20. He's going back to Jerusalem. The prophet Agabus meets him and Agabus takes Paul's belt and he says, thus saith the spirit to the one who owns this belt. He binds himself up and he says, that's what they're going to do for you. And he was weeping and Paul says, what do you mean with this? He says, I'm not only willing to get arrested, I'm willing to die at Jerusalem. And we can, you know, we, we like to, we, 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 we can 
say these words and, and say these bold statements that I'm willing to die for the Lord and I'm willing to go all the way and I'm willing to do this and I'm willing to do that. But when faced with it, face to face, self-preservation just kicks in. Self-preservation just kicks in. So Paul, Paul self-preservation kicked in. He appealed to Caesar. He says in the book of Philippians chapter 3, he says that I may know him. Chapter 10, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. He says, I want to know him that deep. The fellowship of his sufferings. We don't want to know that. Uh, we want to know the glory. Lord, give us the glory that you had with the Father. Take us home and, and crown us and let us walk on streets of gold and let us have mansions in that great city and let us, we want the, the, the glory. But Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Verses 11 gives you his motive. He says in verses 11, he says, that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. You see, we all want that day to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Yes, we're willing to go for it if there's a crown at the end of it. We're willing to do it if there's glory at the end. And we'll take it and we'll take the pain and we'll take the suffering as long as there's glory at the end. Jesus didn't do it for that. His glory was to see us saved in his kingdom. And, and we, you, under, you can't understand it. You can't understand it. And I was telling the guys uh, uh, there at, at home that the, the, between the ant, the small little ant and me, there's a closer relationship in, creator, in creation than what there is between me and God. God and I, the ladder is much, much further than what me and an ant is. The ant can do more than what I can do than what I can do what God can do. We are so far down the ladder, down the rung, that angels marvel at, why would you do this for them? Which of you here would go and die for a bunch of ants? As a matter of fact, we kill them, their annoyances, we crush on them, we walk over them, we sweep them out. We don't have place for them in our home. Which of you would give your life for, for a creature so unworthy? Yet an ant is more worthy than what we are in comparison to us in Christ. The Bible says that his mind, or he said he was, that he steadfastly set his face. Not any part of his body. He set his face towards Jerusalem. You could not talk him out of it. He was going to Jerusalem. He was going to die. He was going to pay the price. It wasn't a nice death. You know, it wasn't the shooting. I don't know what's the time, the time between bullet entering and death generally. And I suppose it matters where they shoot you. But that's relatively quick death. It wasn't just a shooting. No, 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 no. He had to testify first. There were people he had to reach. He had to go and testify first. He had to testify to, 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 to Pilate. Pilate understood who Jesus was. Do you know that there's no place in history that records a halo? There's no place. There's no I don't know where they got this thought from. A halo. Do you know who teaches us about a halo? Spirit of prophecy. It says when, 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 when Pilate asked Jesus, he says, are you the son of God? He says, it is as you say. It says a light circled around Jesus that he saw. He knew that he was dealing with the son of God. After the most grievous, the, the most, the, they went for death penalty when they came to Pilate and they said, he makes himself a king. That was asking for death penalty. And Roman governors, Roman rulers took, didn't take a light 
if you made yourself something, some ruler that you're not supposed to be. He is governor of Jerusalem and there's going to be nobody else. And Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews? He says, has anybody who has revealed it to you? Is it you or are they speaking, are you speaking on their behalf? And he says to, am I a Jew? And he, con he, he spoke to Jesus and Jesus eventually told him, he says, it is as you say. He says, he still came out and says, I find no fault in the man. And he had to appease the crowd. He chose, there was a huge war going on between Pilate and salvation. The enemy of darkness was on this side and the enemy of light was on this side, revealing to him that he is the son of God. And he chose, eventually, he chose the weaker nature. But Jesus was committed to Calvary. He had to meet the thief on the cross. He had to save. There was one more person for him to save and he saved him on the cross. At his weakest point, his strength was there. Tell me something, tell me something. We who claim to know the Bible, how do you look at a man who's got thorns in his head? Thorns in his head, he's dripping with blood, he's beaten, his eyes are closed, his nose is smashed, his lips are all swollen. How do you see in that man, a man that's coming in a kingdom? How do you turn around and say, Lord, remember me when you come in the kingdom? What kingdom are you talking about? When you look at him, there's no kingdom in him. But as Ellen White says, Jesus looked his best. He looked his best when he was being crucified. And, and as David, you pointed that thing. He looked his best. He was the most dignified when he stood before Pilate. Yes, he was beaten. Yes, his body was dripping. And, and no picture, there is no picture. The reason why they don't point the picture, you won't get the face. So they give up the, 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 the sufferings, the, the marks and all that they, to show us a face. Because trust me, the Bible says he was blindfolded and they hit him. He was target practice. A whole lot of men. And when you know the spirit of Satan takes over, not one man hits. Everybody wants to get in something. Everybody wants to get in something. And what they hit with the venom. He could not duck because he didn't know what was coming. He could not ease it with the, with the movement of his head because he didn't know from which direction it was coming. And it was coming fast and thick. And everybody wanted to. And they... Satan was just trying to get him to, 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 to react. And he chose not to react. He chose not to sin. He chose not to, he chose no defense mechanism. He had no defense mechanism. He let himself fully at the exposure of Satan. Do what you have to do, Satan. Do what you have to do. It's your day this year. Do what you have to do. And Satan, Never played with Jesus. He didn't play. There was nobody. I've seen some guys catch hidings. And you see, see guys getting hit to death. We read this morning about, uh, what's his name? Achan. Achan, the whole tribe stoned him. Stoned his wife, his children. There are some horrific deaths. But never before had Satan being so cruel, so intently cruel to a person than he was with Jesus Christ. He just wanted a reaction. That's all he wanted. He wanted one sin. And Jesus opted silence. Silence. That the, he might not have anything to accuse him for. He opted for silence. He kept quiet and he let Satan have his day and Satan took advantage of the opportunity and he beat the son of God. He beat him with everything that he could. He did everything that he could and he got nothing. He drew his blood, he put the thorn of crowns and then they whooped it in, they whacked it in. He was, he set his face steadfastly you could not talk Jesus out of it. Often his disciples said to him, he told his disciples that the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified. And Peter said, Lord, I'll, I'm willing to die for you. I'll go all the way with you. 
Jesus, the Bible says, he had to tread the wine press alone. He had to tread the wine press. And the Bible says, and of the people, none were there to stand with him. While John followed, John could do nothing. While his mother was there close by, she could do nothing but weep. They could just feel sorry for him, but they could do nothing. He tread the wine press alone. There was nobody there with him. His mind was set to Jerusalem. You say to me, Brother Don, I heard you saying that you've come here to, to, to encourage us. How do you encourage us with these? Sorry, I don't have a watch, so I'm looking at the time here. Yeah. I know y'all, I know y'all, y'all, y'all. You're used to the two hours, eh? You're used to. I was looking at uh, uh, Mono's, aunt, Mono's auntie asked me for a video of Devonese in the week, so I was trying to send the one. I thought, let me look for one that's not so long, you know. <laughs> Uh, I've settled on two hours, three minutes. That was the one. <laughs> so uh, you're used to it. And you all will live through it because I know you'll go through two hours every week. But uh, yeah, where, where was I? Ah. Yeah, so. Sorry? Why? Wh 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 how, how, Brother Don, would this text encourage us? How do. What, what, what relevance is this text here for us? What can we take from this text that will encourage us to go forward? I want to say to your friends, you spoke about it this morning, Devonay, the trouble that is coming. The trouble that is coming. Ellen White says there's two things she can't explain. The glories of heaven and the time of trouble. She says the most vivid description cannot portray the time of trouble that lays ahead for the saints of God. The most vivid, the most graphic cannot portray it. I, I, I don't know. Jesus, Jesus, I mean, Jesus had seen things. He'd been around when the flood was there. He'd been around when wars took place, when they took the, the babies of the... the, 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 the the Israelites, and flung them against the rocks. The Babylonians flung their babies against the rock, asked, wanting a question. You don't answer right. They take your baby and they shoot your baby against the rock dead. He had seen those things. He had seen people starve so much that they would buy pigeons droppings. And that was expensive. He had seen hunger to the place where, the place where they would eat their sandals. In the book of Deuteronomy, he says that blessings and curses, he says, I bring before you blessings and curses in chapters 28 and 29. He says, blessings if you choose life and curses if you choose death, if you choose uh, disobedience. And he said to them, one of the things Moses said to them, he says, there's going to come a time where, where, where your delicate woman, those real pretty ones, you know those nice, those ones that are so, they're real pretty polys, eh? He says, when the most delicate woman who would not dare to set her foot on the ground itself. He says, when it comes, he says, those women would, cr would fight to eat the placenta of their wombs. Yeah. He had seen all that there. Jerusalem had been through all that, and yet Jesus says in Matthew 24 and verse 22, he says that unless he cuts the time short, no flesh would survive. He's not talking about human flesh. He's talking about animals because we know in the siege, the first thing is they eat the animals. They go for the animals and then they get to the unclean animals, the donkeys. And even that, the Bible says a donkey's head was sold for, I don't, can't remember how many shekels. They start eating the unclean animals. And the Bible says there was five horses left in the city. And you know how the people can talk. Yeah, king's riding horses, yeah, but we got no food. I mean, that horse could feed a whole family for a long time. They had gotten down to the horses. Human, human, 
what's the word? Human desire to save themselves. They start eating, and the Bible says, and they started eating their children. They start eating their children, and they start arguing about whose child do we eat first? Today we eat yours, tomorrow we eat ours, okay? Set deal. But it shows that, the, that they, they hadn't got the message of appetite. How do you eat a whole baby in a day? That appetite was, uh, sorry, temperance was out of the window. I mean, if you're eating the baby, at least pay him for a week, you know? But they ate him in one day, the next day was the other woman's turn, and she refused to give her child. Guys, the, Jesus says, he says, it's, except he cuts those days short, no flesh would survive. Daniel says that there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. All the things I've explained to you, the eating of the woman, eating a placenta, the eating of children, the eating of animals, he, Jesus had seen that the Daniel had been through that day. His, his nation had been through that day. Daniel and him were shut up in the city for a long time while the Babylonians waited outside. And they would just wait you out and wait you out and wait you out. And eventually they give in because there's hunger. The people go out. What did the three, the four lepers say? They said, if we go, if we, in, if we stay here, we die. If we go to the, the to the Syrians, we die there too. So let's rather go to the Syrians. Maybe there's a bit of mercy with them that they'll have compassion upon us lepers. Now, if it was a good woman coming in, yeah, you might have compassion. Say, you know what, we can use this one, yeah. But a leper, nah, your chances are they're gonna kill you. But it was so bad that the lepers took that chance. And they went there and they found that everybody had died. And the words of Elisha had come true, that tomorrow barley will be sold for so much. And everybody, and they came and they went into the city and they told the king, they said, there's nobody left. And they went and they ate. But Jesus had seen that the Daniel knew about that day. He knew about, yet he says a time is coming such as the world has never seen. Jesus repeated the exact same words. He says, a time of trouble is coming such as the world has never seen. Jesus had to go through his time of trouble. The cross of Calvary was there before him in order for him to get to heaven. Get back to the Bible says, the time had come for him to be received up. He knew he had to go to his father, but Calvary laid before him and his, between him and his father. Friends, between heaven and now, there's a time of trouble. There's a time of trouble. And I can't tell you all about the time of trouble. I wish I could say that I'm ready. I'm not yet ready. I wish I could say that I will be able to stand. I wish heaven could say like, like uh, God said to Satan about Job, go try him, go try him, see. I wish that could be said of me. I can't say that of me. But one thing I do know that there's a time of trouble that is coming. The Bible says that, the Bible speaks about it in Revelation. The Bible says that all the world followed the beast. All the world, and you're not talking about the church disliking you. You're not talking about communities not disliking you. You're not talking where you'll be cut off from social media. You'll be cut off from traveling. You'll be cut off from food. You'll be cut off from electricity and power. You'll be cut off from everything. And Jesus is going to have it just like that for his people. He's going to take them through on his strength, not on their strength. The, those that are sealed, that make it through the time of trouble, make it through on the strength of Jesus Christ and on nobody else. Nobody else. There's going to be no strong man amongst us. No one guy that is strong and yeah, we're looking up to him. He's our leader. No. No. What's the book called? What's the book called? I think it's the faith that I live by, the faith that I live by, 
on that book, yeah, I think it's that book, where she has the two mountains and a rope let down. And she says that the children of God travel up this huge mountain. She says, you see the small light going up this huge mountain. And they get to that, and below them and, 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 and the other mountain that represents the new Jerusalem, she says, there is a chasm that they must pass through, but they can't make it. And she says, then they see a rope let down from heaven. And all who by faith make it and grab that rope and cross over, make it into the new Jerusalem. Others look at the chasm and they say the chasm is too great. And they see that, oh, we're never going to make it. I don't have the strength to hold on. And they'll turn back and they'll say, no, came thus far no more. But friends, the Bible tells us that the time of trouble is coming upon this world that no man has ever seen or witnessed, but that the saints of God must go through. And I'm here to tell you, press on, press on. Set your face steadfastly towards heaven. Make sure that heaven is your goal and that you're willing to cut out mother and father. Make sure that you are so determined that you're willing to cut out anything and everything to make it into the kingdom of God. Set your face towards Jerusalem that Lord come what may, by the grace of God, please keep me in the hall of your hand. Because the time of trouble is right upon us. It is right upon us, it's right upon us, it's right upon us. I tell you what, it's not gonna be long. It's not gonna be long. When trouble will break out in this world and it's gonna break out, as Ellen White says, it's going to increase without any stop. It's actually gonna pick up a momentum as it goes. And the momentum is going to, and it's going to break out and then, the sweet is going to be separated from the, the tears. Those who are loyal to Jesus Christ, not those who are baptized, not those who are participating in church services, not the ones who preach. No, it's those who have made peace with heaven, who have Jesus Christ living in their hearts. And not, not as a guest, not as a guest. You know, we like to welcome Jesus into our hearts every day. And it's, it's, it's a noble thing. But as Lord and Savior of our lives. Not Lord, you can come and have a seat and, you know, watch me live my life today, guide me and direct me. No, no, no. I have no life, Lord. You are my life. Until we come to the place where Christ becomes everything to us. He is nothing. Listen, listen friends. I don't know how many millions of years Satan lived in the presence of God before he started sinning. I don't know. But what I do know is that there came a time where he started, where sin was conceived in his heart. And he decided he wants to be like God. Why he's tired of worshiping God. He's tired of adoring God. He wants to be like God. He doesn't say I will be better than God. No, no human mind can picture anything better than God. We can't. We're not made that way. We, yeah, can't even picture God. We can't even picture God. You can't even decide that you want to be. We can't say we want to be like God. Who's seen God? None of us. You tried, Devon, you ever tried understanding Ezekiel, the four living creatures? You ever tried as they describe it, they try to draw the picture mentally? You can't. That's the living creatures. You can't. And so Satan said, I want to be like him. Friends, it, 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 Satan wasn't, you know, we, we, we must be like him. We must be like him. But we must be like him in character, not in power. Not in power. We, we can't handle power. We can't handle power. Power makes us think we're invincible. Power makes us oppress. Power tells us that we're better than others. Power tells us that 
they should serve me. We, do, we, we, we can't relate to power and, 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 and self-sacrifice. The two just don't go together in human minds. Power means I'm in charge, I'm in control, I, my will, my way, me, 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 they down there, I'm up here. That's what power means to us. But in heaven's terms, power is self-sacrificing. The power of God, the Ellen White says, and everybody will agree that the, the greatest evidence of God's power was seen at Calvary. Not in his brightness, not in his glory, not in that, was in Calvary where he gave up his life for worthless human beings. The same people he's coming to save are the same people that decided to kill him. Friends, Jesus is coming. I'm here to, to just to remind you, not to tell you, you'll know that they, you'll hear it often, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, and sometimes you can even get sick of hearing it, but even if you're sick of hearing it, Jesus is coming, and it's going to be the day, the Bible says that we're going to crush the teeth in our mouth if we're not saved. You're going to bite your teeth so hard that they will crush, they'll crush each other. Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth if we don't make it. And do you know when Jesus comes, when before Jesus comes, probation is going to close, but then do you know when probation closes? Satan stirs up us, stirs us up with the spirit of revival. He says, you better start going to church now. Get yourself ready. Spirit of, the probation is closed. He knows you lost. He says, get ready, start going to church. And he creates a revival, a false revival. You see, Satan can't create a, a very false, a, a, a satanic revival, no. He, he creates a godly revival where he tells the people, true godliness, you'll need to get to down to true godliness when it's too late, when the door has been shut. Oh, Spirit Bible tells us that the five virgins came back. They went to go and buy oil. They went for oil and they came back. But the seller was the wrong person that time. The wrong person was selling them oil. And so they bought the wrong oil. They came with the wrong oil, but the door was shut. Friends, Jesus is coming. Press forward, Sister Militia, press forward. Put your head steadfastly towards it. Steadfastly towards it. Because the time is coming very soon when we're going to hear. We won't hear, but Jesus will utter those words. He says, it is finished. He that is done, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. The hymn writer says in the book 6598, it says, when, when, the, when it's proclaimed, the mystery is finished. The mystery is finished. 6,000 years will have passed. Satan, I'm convinced about that. You can't tell me anything else. That Satan only has 6,000 years. He has 6,000 years in which to work. 1,000 years for Jesus, for, 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 for judgment. 1,000 years. Paul says in the book of Acts chapter 17, he says, for he has set a day in which to judge the world. He has set a thousand years to judge the world. He's, Jesus is coming, friends. And he's only taking to heaven those who have given their lives completely, Lord, that is Lord of him. And I, 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 last week I preached from... Uh, Luke chapter 9 verse 1 and 2 and I said to them Luke chapter 9 verse 1 and 2 is the scariest text in the Bible it's the scariest text the Bible says that Jesus gave his disciples power and authority to cleanse to, to, to heal diseases and, and to authority over all demons and they went and they did that. But the Bible does not tell us. Luke, Matthew chapter 10 tells us that included in those 12 was Ju Judas. And Judas never made it into the kingdom. And yet he had the power over all demons. 
but he didn't make it into the kingdom. There's one thing Jesus, Judas left the door open for the demon, for the man, the man called Luca, the demon called Luca. He had access to Jesus' to sorry, to Judas' life. And eventually, when he came and he kissed Jesus and he says, Rabbi, Jesus was his rabbi, a good teacher. Luca was his Lord. Money was his Lord. Jesus was his teacher. He loved Jesus as a teacher, as a good man. Why he saw this man walk on water, he knew it's not an ordinary man. He saw this man, yeah, calm the sea, turn around, and just said, peace be still. And the sea was, and they even said, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. He had seen many things that Jesus did. And he knew that this was not an ordinary person. And yet, the same man gave him authority and power. He, the Bible says he, he gave them power. And then he sent them. And yet, Judas didn't make it in. And we think we're going to make it in without any power. He didn't make it in with power. And we don't have no power. What does 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 say? You know what? Uh, 2 Timothy, was it 1 Timothy 3, verse 5? They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Friends, Jesus is coming. I can't say this here more and more. All I can say to you all, as a family, as a church, get ready to meet God. Make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure. They asked Jesus, they said to him in Luke chapter 13, verses 23, they said to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Jesus says in verse 24, he says, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many will seek, all of us here seeking to go to heaven, for many will seek to enter and shall not be able to. Everybody, if I asked who wants to go to heaven, everybody will put up their hands. But I think if we ask who's striving, we get a different response. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Fight. Fight. Fight with people at home. Fight with your diet, with your stomach and the worms in your stomach. You know, you say the worms are talking. Fight with them. Fight with them when they say, have another piece of meat. Shouldn't have the first one. He says, have another piece of meat. Have more. Appetite, appetite, appetite. I can't tell the guys that we've been through the appetite study and we talk about it every week about, you know, the very, it was the first temptation, it's going to be the last temptation. It's going to be the last temptation. Daniel, uh, uh, Revelation 13 is about the ability to trade for food. Revelation 13, that no man might buy or sell save him that has the mark. We can do without cause. I mean, we weren't born with cause, eh? We can do without cause. We can walk if we have to. Somebody was telling me the other day they walked to Greenwood Park and they walked to Wentworth. They know the mileage. And, yeah. well, we can do that if we have to. Eh? But food, food, you'll sell yourself for food. You'll sell your soul for food. You'll sell your soul for food. The Bible says that Daniel, in Daniel 1 verse 8, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. What did he purpose, my sister Malisha? His purpose not to defile himself. That he will not, what? Defile himself. He didn't say, I don't like the king's food. It wasn't about taste or, you know, the way they cook their food. No. Daniel wasn't talking about a matter of taste or, you know, this is the way we cook it. No, no, no. He says the food, he was telling the king, what a nerve he had to tell the king, the governor of the, the rule of the world, then known world, that your food is defiling. So the Bible says he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Ariok, or no, it wasn't Asper, the guy that 
That wasn't Ariok there. Ariok was the captain of the guard, Daniel chapter 2. Yeah. De Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz said to him, must have thought, I can't take that message to the king. You tell me, I must tell the king, your food is defiling now. He says, you want my head, Daniel, you want my head cut off. Daniel said, okay, listen, give us just 10 days. We'll keep this thing between us. Just give us the 10 days test. And the Bible says after 10 days, Ashpenaz was startled to see these men. Just 10 days. And what did he ask for? He says, give us vegetables and water. Give us vegetables. What happened yesterday? A guy left, he says he don't eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> One guy came yesterday, he came Thursday night, he left yesterday, he said don't eat vegetables. <laughs> but yeah, friends, that's going to be the great test that we're going to be. And, and, and diet, diet, if we haven't mastered that there, it, Ellen White says very plainly, plainly that if we had overcome in that regard, we would overcome in all other things. But we fail in all other things because we fail at that there. You see, we can't, we, 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 we can't interpret dreams. We can't get to chapter two because we stuck still with chapter one. We can't even talk about going into the furnace, chapter three, because we stuck at chapter one. We can't talk about going into the lion's den because we, we, we still at chapter one. We're battling with chapter one. If, if Daniel had failed in chapter one, there was no chapter two, three, four, five. There was none of that there. He had to get chapter one right. And then the others followed. Oh, friends, that is part of the great preparation that we need to make for the second coming of Jesus. Do I, am, as Paul says, I've not yet attained. No, I've not yet attained. You can see by my weight, I've not yet attained. I've not yet attained. But we all have, still have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. We have a chance to make right. We have a chance to make sure that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I always tell people I hate doing Revelation chapter 13. Because it is so sad, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 says, And they worshipped the dragon, who gave his power to the beast. They worshipped who? Satan, who gives his power to papacy. They worship Satan. And verses 8 is even worse. It says, and all will worship him whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What a sad thing to understand that those who worship him, those who, who give in to the papacy, their names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let us talk about the mark of the beast. Let's talk about the mark of the beast. I don't want you all to go around telling Catholics now your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. No. As a matter of fact, a great number of them are going to come out and join God's people. A great number of them are coming out. They're going to join. But it's going to be on the witness that we give. They're not going to come out here thumb-sucking. It's on the witness that we give. For they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's how they're going to overcome. So friends, you know that soon we are to be received up. Soon we are to be received up. Let us steadfastly set our faces towards Calvary. Each one's Calvary is going to be different. Each one, all the disciples of Jesus had a different death. They faced a different challenge, but they met death bravely. They met death. I, you know, people say that you read Ellen White's books and yeah, she talks about uh, great controversy, how people died and all that. Day. I got a book at home, not written by Ellen White, it's written by John Fox. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's, John Fox describes, they say a lot of Ellen White's writings was taken from John Fox's thing and Nothing wrong with that there. But John Fox, he tells you how some of these men died. 
where they said, listen, man, burn us at the face first. Burn us at the face first. They tried burning them at the back. And they said, no, burn us here in the face. Some of them, when they were asked to recant, he, he, they said, man, you know, when they were asked to recant, they said, listen, something more than death you've got to threaten us with for us to recant. They, they made it very plain. They said, listen, if you don't kill us, we're going to die. You're going to die. We all die. So don't you have more, something more terrible than death? Whatever you can come up with, come up with something more than that there because we're facing death anyway. So, and they were still talking and the one brother said, brother, stop talking, let's sing. Let them do what they do. We do what we do. We praise the Lord. And they went down singing. Friends, I'm not here to scare you. But Jesus, he gave us warnings of these things. He says it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. Got to make sure that we're ready. No guessing it, no second guessing it. Make sure that you're ready. That when the time comes, you'll be able to face the crisis, meet the crisis, knowing that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Our oh, Father which art in heaven, Oh Lord, we are so unworthy, we are so unworthy. There's nothing good in us that you should save us. There is absolutely nothing good in us that you should save us. As a matter of fact, Lord God, we are filthy. We are unrighteous, we are unholy, unclean, unpure. Your word says that even our righteous deeds are as filthy rags before you. Father, we have nothing to bring to you. Except, Lord God, we can claim that the cross of Jesus, your Son, has paid the penalty for our sins. And whatever they may be, Lord God, your cross, the cross of your Son, Jesus, has paid the price for the most vilest of sinners and for the most sweetest of sinners. Your cross has paid the price. We don't have it within us. We don't have strength within us to make it through, Father God. We can't even promise you that we're going to be faithful to you. We're asking you to keep us faithful. We're asking you to carry us through. We're asking you, Lord God, to cover us with the righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ. We don't have any righteousness at all. Why your word says, Joshua, the high priest, was had filthy garments on. Who are we, Lord? Who are we? We're not bragging because of our fault. We have no distinction in sin. All we have is a shame face. And we have the cross that stands between us and you. Please accept us because of what your son Jesus Christ has done for us. Please save us. Please save us, Father. We can't save ourselves. We can't even give ourselves to you. Please take us. We can't give. We don't know how to give ourselves. We're so selfish. We're so self-preserved that we don't know how to give ourselves completely. So we ask you to take us and just mold us and make us and, and fashion us after your will. Forgive us for who we are, Father. Please save us a place in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Someday the silver cord will break And I no more as now shall sing But all oh, the joy when I shall wake Within the palace of the King And I shall see him face to face 